Alright, let me be brutally honest. Intel, what's going on, bud? I know that was kind of an odd way to start a video, but the topic I want to discuss today is frankly kind of sad for me to talk about because I'm going to be saying some pretty controversial things if you've been following the consumer PC market for the past year or so. And while I by no means hate Intel, they've been making some pretty questionable decisions with their recent product launches. And by recent, I mean their consumer desktop products introduced from 2018 onwards. And I know I promised you guys 10th gen CPU reviews, but at this point, I don't really want to review a product that I think is objectively worse than their previous generation products from an engineering perspective. Let me go into a little more detail. So if we go back to August of 2015 with the debut of Intel's Skylake microarchitecture, the jump in performance over Broadwell was relatively significant based on the chips you were comparing, and warranted an upgrade not only on the premise of performance, but also efficiency. Based on Intel's reworked 14 nanometer process, this meant that circuit traces could be more efficiently packed into smaller die sizes. And the physical properties of smaller wiring meant that less current and voltage was required to keep power levels at operational capacity, thanks to less leakage and a more precise transistor definition. On the production side of things, being able to more precisely define a trace or a transistor means that you can literally make them smaller, which reduces the amount of voltage that's needed to be applied to the base of the transistor in order to flip the switch. And even if you're running the same amount of current, voltage reductions can help to shave off some wattage that is needed to run the chip. Obviously for 2015, Intel's 14 nanometer was bleeding edge and was worlds above AMD's 13 nanometer bulldozer architecture. And it even beat out Intel's own 22 nanometer process that proved so popular back in the days of Haswell. But when AMD introduced Zen in late 2017, also built on a 14 nanometer process, Intel still had a significant per-core performance advantage that, while not shutting out its AMD competition, showed just how advanced the Skylake microarchitecture really was over any of its competition. However, even at this point in time, Skylake was nearing on two years old, and besides the lack of a significant performance uplift since its release, several hardware vulnerabilities forced Intel to implement expensive software patches which meant that the IPC advantage that Intel had over Zen was chiseled away ever so slightly. It's kind of unfortunate, but at the end of the day, they can't really just send out revised silicon to every Skylake buyer. So the option that they went with, while not optimal for performance, was the only logistical choice that they really had. And after the Spectre and Meltdown fiasco that they went through in 2017, it was obvious that some evolution of Skylake was needed to not only patch these significant security issues, but to do so without impacting software performance. Yet with the release of Coffee Lake, they optimized the exact same microarchitecture, without introducing any hardware level patching for the issues that were well known even before the release of these chips. Now compared to KB Lake, which was the first gen revision of Skylake, Coffee Lake didn't improve per thread performance by any significant margin. However, the core counts were increased across the board to keep Intel in the game when compared to the productivity monster of Zen. Honestly, that improvement was welcomed with open arms, and even then, the overall core design for Skylake was still far superior to anything AMD was offering at the time. And when compared to KB Lake, Coffee Lake offered a significant spec improvement that made upgrading actually worth the money. However, those of you who remember that launch, nobody was particularly thrilled that the 8th gen chips were officially incompatible with the 6th and 7th gen motherboards, despite all these generations using the same LGA 1151 socket. And the release of Coffee Lake, while looking at it retrospectively, showed us that Intel was due to show us some, if any architectural reworks rather than a second gen optimization phase. If you look at 6th and 7th gen Intel Core i-series chips, the specification differences between the generations was literally indiscernible, with i3s sticking with 2 cores and 4 threads, i5s with 4 cores, and i7s with 4 cores 8 threads. And when you have identical core layouts using what are really identical slabs of silicon, 
much doesn't really need to change on the I.O. and power delivery side of things, making both generations backwards and forwards compatible. Now moving into 8th gen, on all consumer level chips, that being i3s through i7s, two cores using the same silicon were added to the dies, meaning that in the case of all the SKUs introduced, power delivery requirements increased by as much as, if not more than, 50% across the board. And this is why Coffee Lake compatible motherboards dropped backwards and forward compatibility with 6th and 7th gen chips. Even though Coffee Lake, which includes both 8th and 9th gen, used the same LGA 1151 socket as the previous two generations, the extra power requirements of the additional circuitry packed into the dies meant that some of the pins and traces had to either be optimized to deliver more voltage and current to the chip, or that some of the pin functions changed from data functionality to power delivery. So in theory, if you plopped a 7700K into a Z370 board, the chip wouldn't be able to communicate with certain aspects of the chipset, and in a worst case scenario, might even be getting too much power pumped through it, which could fry lanes in the chip not intended to carry higher voltage and amperage. This was an unfortunate obstacle to those interested in upgrading to Coffee Lake processors, but the performance uplift was so drastic that it was honestly worth almost every penny. And thankfully, Intel kept 8th gen boards compatible with 9th gen chips through BIOS updates. But looking at their 10th gen chips, they redesigned the socket to include an extra 49 pins. Now I'm obviously not on the Intel design team, but from doing some research into the specifications of the chip, the main reason that they introduced these new, more beefy sockets was to allow for even more power to be delivered to the chips. With all the mainstream processors sporting hyperthreading, as well as getting a couple more cores on certain models, the power requirements to run a chip with these beefy specs using a 5-year-old microarchitecture on a 5-year-old production process increased drastically. And with them pushing clocks past 5 GHz on a few models, voltage has to be cranked to not only keep the individual core stable, but to also drive the increased data throughput thanks to the increased amount of cache and inner core communication. And if you want some real world numbers, here are the idle and full load power consumption numbers for a handful of the recently released Comet Lake chips. I also threw my 9700K results in there just to compare to last gen's balls to the wall gaming chip. And peak power consumption numbers I was able to find put it at consuming over 130% more power. Now, admittedly, these chips are the most powerful consumer level CPUs that Intel has ever released. There's no doubt about it. But with these chips guzzling power, even when they're not really doing all that much, it's a hard case to make for Comet Lake, when all the previously mentioned drawbacks still apply to every single desktop 10th gen chip on top of the new power consumption issues. To me at least, this screams that Intel needs to either ditch 14 nanometer in favor of their long-awaited 10 nanometer process, or switch future revisions to 7 nanometer instead. It just is not feasible to keep consuming this much electricity on chips that are using technology first introduced 5 years ago. The general Skylake microarchitecture is very powerful and very flexible though. And even now, 14 nanometer Intel cores are still crushing 7 nanometers M2 cores, which were introduced less than a year ago, and it's a real testament to Intel's ability to engineer powerful, yet very reliable products that maintain their performance compared to similarly spec chips from AMD. I love what Intel is doing with pushing up core counts, don't get me wrong. Having more cores on die is not an issue whatsoever. But the issues begin when they're using an architecture designed to deliver high single-threaded throughput at the cost of multi-core performance. And with the recent releases coming from Intel's labs, they're really trying to improve multi-core performance by increasing core counts rather than optimizing inner core communication and scheduling. At this point, Skylake needs some sort of major rework to improve power consumption figures. But the only way they're going to be able to do that is if they ditch 14 nanometer. We've been on this process since late 2014, six years ago. And in that time, AMD has gone from a 32 nanometer architecture down to 7 nanometers. And it's proving to not only be more efficient, 
but it's also cheaper on them since the silicon area occupied by the chips is smaller than it's ever been before. For now though, I'd honestly suggest holding off on buying 10th gen CPUs if you're seriously considering an upgrade to one. What I would instead recommend is to be patient and wait until the end of the year for smaller Intel chips to reach widespread availability. Because when Intel finally does punch back with smaller processes, it's going to be one of the best periods for PC gamers. So thank you for watching, and if you enjoyed, don't forget to leave a like and subscribe, and click the bell icon so you'll be notified about all our future uploads. I'm sorry if I sounded relatively negative in this video, I didn't mean for it to turn out that way, and I'm instead really trying to bring attention to issues that I feel are holding Intel back in the general consumer space. I'm not trying to bring negativity their way, but I'm instead trying to bring constructive criticism because I personally have a connection to the company. A family member worked there, I've been to one of their campuses several times, and I've gotten to see some of their work. As well as knowing some of the engineers who work on this tech, albeit not super personally, but it's just a personal connection I have with the company. But take that as you will. It was fun talking, and if you want to learn more about computer hardware software, then the annotations on screen are a great place to start. Thanks for spending your time with me, and thanks for watching.